What are we just saying? Now, Mr. Miller has no idea what I was going to preach. That's not the title of my message. Nothing. So, and I know me, okay? <laughs> As people say, I know the guy that looks at me and that looks at me in the mirror every day, and it's, I know me. I know my fallen state, and I know I make mistakes. And for God to coordinate all that, it's truly God. Really, it is. So that, that's neat. That's encouraging to see. Because honestly, anybody that's prepared anything knows this. The biggest struggle is to find out what you're supposed to preach. Because you don't want to, I mean, there's message. I've looked, okay? There's messages everywhere online, okay? <laughs> right? And you don't want to be one of those people that just copies somebody else's message. Not that there's, if you're, you know, hey, if God tells you to preach something, whatever. But so he gives you things, and that's, that's the neat thing. And when he joins those things up together, that's the, that's the best part. So Joshua chapter 14, and we'll read uh, verse 7 through 14. It says, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him again as it were was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thou, thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. So in case you don't understand what that means, that means he's 85 years old. All right? Common core math. No, I'm just kidding. All right? He's 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now I'm hoping at 85 I can say the same thing, right? <laughs> now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I should be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to be in church. I'm thankful for the opportunity uh, to preach. I'm thankful for the church that you've given us, and I pray that you would continue to watch over Pastor and be with him and bless him and his wife on vacation. And I pray that you'd use the message tonight to speak to hearts, and I pray that we, we would be obedient to you. I pray that you'd give us the strength, uh, give me the strength as I preach, but give us the strength as we go throughout this next week, that we would know uh, exactly what we're supposed to do, and that you'd help us uh, through each day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, when I think of uh, Caleb, I think of uh, a man of great courage and faithfulness. I think of somebody who we need Caleb's in the day and age that we live in. If you haven't noticed, of course, it's never been popular to be a Christian, but it's really not popular to be a Christian today. It's really not popular to be a Christian that stands for certain things. And it's not popular among other Christians. We know that if we're paying attention. There's uh, uh, not as many people that would be, you know, it's, it's interesting, and I think I mentioned this last time I preached, but uh, it's interesting that someone that I work with that's not even saved said, you know what's wrong with America? People don't go to church on Sunday. He said, when I was a kid, Everybody went to church on Sunday. 
And then they went home and they sat down as a family around a table and they talked and they ate together. And they at least did that on Sundays. He said, that's what's wrong with America. And I said, wow, you get it, right? He, doesn't, he goes, well, I don't go to church anymore, but he said, that's what's wrong with America. He can see it, though, at least. And that there's that, that fear of God, that respect. Well, you know, we, we sing the song, and I'm not going to sing it for you, I promise. Uh, but we sing the song in the kids' class, right? Twelve went down to spy in Canaan, ten were bad, and two were good, right? And, and who were the two that were good? Any of the kids know? Bella? Caleb and Joshua, all right? So Caleb and Joshua were the two. So there was 12 of them and only two of them, right? Believe God, basically that what it comes down to. So uh, this man, Caleb, had some, some things about him that I think we can learn a few things from. And so I'd like to talk tonight about what Caleb was made of. Uh, back in our passage here in verse 8, it says, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I, wholly followed the Lord my God. First of all, Caleb had character. He had character. What is character? Character is doing what you're supposed to do even when everyone else is not doing it. Or doing right even though nobody's watching. Right? There's a lot of definitions of character. Um, uh, you, I have this written down. I, I read it somewhere in a book. But you can borrow brains, but you cannot borrow character, right? You can, you can read books and borrow someone else's brains, but if you don't have character, you don't got what it takes. Uh, and that's not good English. I'm sorry, but <clears throat> I didn't borrow the English part, brains, okay? Uh, character is not made in a crisis. It's only exhibited, Right? If you don't have, when something comes up, if you don't have character, and if you don't have God helping you, you don't have power, it's going to show. Right? Your true character is going to be revealed. I had this written down. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Your true character is revealed when pressure is applied, right? Just like, uh, you know what, if you have a, a water pipe or uh, um, anything like that where there's pressure applied, the weaknesses show up really quick when there's a lot of pressure, right? And normally, those weaknesses wouldn't show up, but when there's, a lot more, when there's more pressure involved, they show up, right? Um, there's, we always say this at work, say, you can talk a big game, but when it goes down, we'll see who the real men are. And it's true. There's a lot of people that are this, this, this. If this ever happens, this is what I'm going to do. You know what? They're not there. They disappear. Hey, where'd so-and-so go? This happened the other day. Where'd so-and-so go? He's in the basement. Where'd this person go? Oh, he left and went home, and nobody knew he went home. Why? Because he got scared. Do you think everybody else was scared? <laughs> yeah, we were scared. But you, you do what you're supposed to, right? Your, your character is revealed. Now, again, Caleb made the point, and I am going to make the point too, that if there's any good that is in me, it comes from the Lord. And Caleb constantly refers to the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And that's the, what we should be doing. If we handle a situation correctly, it's because the Lord gave us help, because he gave us the strength. Because you know what? I, I don't talk a whole lot about what I do for a living, okay, for obvious reasons. And if you don't know, I work in a prison. When a convicted murderer stands you in the face and says he's going to attack you, the Lord can take that situation and make you feel like you're on a country field with cows. I, that's, I know that's weird. And you can be calm as calm can be, and you don't lose your temper. That comes from the Lord. That doesn't come, that doesn't come from me. That comes from the Lord. And I had a sergeant say to me, he goes, 
He goes, how in the world are you calm? And I said, that's not for me. Because I don't want to be calm right now. My natural flesh wants to do something. God can do that. God can, just like I mentioned before, God can not two people, right? Here, here's what I like about, I don't really, like I said, there's a lot that goes into preparing for a message. Here's what I like about preaching on Sunday night, though, because I'm not in here on Sunday morning for the service. I have no idea what was preached in the morning. Actually, I tried to watch this afternoon, but I couldn't find it. So, uh, but, <laughs> so I have no idea. Mr. Miller, like I said, Right? He, and that's what you want. You can, you can listen, and parents, parents know this, you can talk about something till you're blue in the face. But if it doesn't sink in, if, if, they're, if it doesn't sink into their heart, it's not really going to take. Right? Because they have to figure it out on their own. Yeah, you're guiding them, you're teaching them, you're having family devotions, you're talking about things you're using. You know, just like it says in Joshua uh, chapter 1, you're, you know, putting verses up in your house, you're talking about things, you're, you're attributing things to God, but they actually have to get it, right? They, it, it's, you know, uh, you go off on your own or you're in situations by yourself as you get older as a kid. If it's real, the real stuff will come out. If, you, if it didn't take... You're in trouble, right? It, ha it has to be real. And that's where the character comes in. That's, that's what Caleb had. And his character was displayed by this. He had opposition. It says in verse 8, it says, Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. In other words, his supposed friends maybe even family members, they were, were basically attacking him and, and Joshua. And they were saying that what he's, they're, they're quacks. We're in trouble. And Caleb and Joshua said, no, we're not in trouble. We need to have faith in God and God is going to deliver us. But they turned the heart of the people against them. That's what's going to happen. You're going to, and you probably have, some of you have seen it, where friends and family turn and make and have opposition with you and fight against you, right? He was uh, his another way his character was displayed. First of all, despite opposition, but he was determined. He said, "I'm going to follow the Lord no matter what." He said, uh, right here. He says, "Though none go with me, I will follow." No turning back, just like the song that we just sang. He says. Even if nobody goes with me, I'm going to do what's right. You know what? Every one of us, on a weekly basis, is probably put in situations like that. Where you're the only one that's doing what's right. Everyone else is doing what's wrong. And you're saying, hey, whoa, whoa, we're, you know, let's not, and, and what happens? I know what happens where I work when you try to do what's right. They say, oh, goody two-shoes, or whatever. They, may, they have all kinds of things that they like to say. Well, somebody has to do what's right. Sometimes, you know what, sometimes it even happens in church. Where, you know what, and, and here's the thing. I've, I've, I've tried to teach my children this. We're not going to, they'll ask a question. They'll say, how come so-and-so does this? And maybe it's something, something that we don't do. And I'll say, well, is it against the Bible? No. I said, well, that's their house. And if they decide that's what they need to do, it's not unbiblical. Good, go, go for it. If, you know what, if they have a higher standard in a certain area than I do, I'm not going to make fun of them. Why? Hey, God showed them what to do. You know what? We're not robots. 
We're, we're individuals. And God deals in our hearts different ways at different times. So he had character. Secondly, Caleb had confidence. His confidence came from the Lord. There's seven verses in this passage that I just read. Nine times he says the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Why? Because that's where his confidence came from. That's how he got the strength that he needed. That's where it came from. But just like I said in the beginning, any good thing that's in us or any good thing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a parent or as anybody that, that we do comes from the Lord. Um, uh, one, Michael, I was picking on this morning, he said some, something very profound this morning. And I don't think he was trying to be a wise guy. He was just being Michael. Michael's very intelligent in this, what he says. And I'm, I mean that, seriously. He says to me this morning, I said, Michael, how are you this morning? And he says, well, I woke up. And I says, well, yeah, that's, you know what, that's good. <laughs> that's, maybe he has a problem waking up. I don't know. But he said, I woke up. Well, hey, we're, hey, you woke up, right? Some people didn't wake up this morning. And they're still not awake, right? That's, that's from the Lord. He, he allowed him to get out of bed, right? That's that's encouraging. So he mentions the Lord nine times, right? So turn over to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. So the Lord was his priority. You know, the Lord... We'll see in this verse, but he's better than man. He's better, we already know that, but he's better than man. He's better than princes. Psalm 119 and verse 8. I'm sorry, 118 and verse 8. I'm sorry. That's a good verse, too. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? But that's not the one we're looking for. <laughs> sorry. I looked at it in my notes three times and said the wrong one. 118, verse 8. And it says, and if I remember correctly, uh, this is the exact middle verse of the Bible. So this is pretty interesting that this is the middle verse of the Bible. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So what, what is the lesson there? It's better to trust in the Lord. And Caleb had his trust in the Lord. Um, uh, turn over to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 26 says, for the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. The Lord shall be thy confidence. You know what? If, if anything, you know what some people did? The last president that we had, some people took their eyes off the Lord and they put a confidence in a man. And they thought a man was going to deliver America. Well, guess what? We got a replacement. And I'm not going to make any comments bashing the president, okay? If you know anything about me, you know I don't really like what our president stands for, right? But can we put confidence? If you were going to put confidence in a man, could we put confidence in the president we have right now? No, we could not, right? But God is still alive. You know, it's something, um, honestly, when the, the election, well, no, I'm not going to say I'll keep I'll keep that comment to myself, too. When the election results came out, <clears throat> whether true or on, on, anyways, when the election results came out, I was a little, I got a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. You know why? Because I was kind of, happy with some of the things that were going on. And I thought, oh boy, here we go, right? 
But you know what? I was reminded of something that day within minutes. God didn't die. <laughs> right? He's, he's still there. Right? So we have our, that, and he said, you know what? Hey, your trust should be in me, not in a president, not in a politician. Right? So we have our, the Lord is better than man. He's better than princes. He should be our confidence. And turn over to Proverbs, a few pages over to Proverbs chapter 14. If you want them to be your strong, your confidence, one of the things you need to do is you need to have the fear of the Lord. It says in the fear, in verse 26, Proverbs 14, it says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord, verse 27, is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Um, in another passage, uh, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, you know what? When I was a kid, and it helped me develop a fear for the Lord, in a good way, okay? I wasn't scared to death of my dad, but I feared him. When my mom said, okay, smart guy, wait till your father gets home. The bargaining began. And I'd say, what do I have to do for you to keep this to yourself? And it never worked. And the worst part about it was, and my dad maybe doesn't remember this, my dad worked long hours. And he didn't deal with things as soon as he got home, which is probably a smart thing. Not till after dinner. So you had to sit there and endure the whole supper, knowing that judgment's coming. Not fun, but you know what? It gives you a good, healthy. There's nothing wrong with, but you know, the fear of the Lord is healthy. You can, you know what? He wants to be your friend, but he also wants to know that there's lines that you don't cross. Just like a parent that has to draw some hard line. Listen, you know what? I, did, I, was, I had to take care of something yesterday in my house. I hate. If you're doing it the right way, honestly, you're going to hate having to take care of it. Kids, can I just tell you something? Good parents, which you have good parents, good parents don't get together as adults and say, oh, last week I got to discipline my kids five times. Woo, high five. We don't get excited about it, whether you think so or not. I know as a kid, you think, oh, they must really enjoy this. No, it rips me up on the inside. It honestly does. And, and you know, when I was a kid, my dad would say, he didn't always say this, but he'd say, this hurts me more than it's going to hurt you. And I'm like, that's a lie. I never said it out loud, but I was thinking it, right? And then I became, then I became a parent, and I said, no, that is true. Because you know what? That's not what you want to do. But you know what? You also want to do what the Bible tells you to do, and you want your kids to listen. And, you, and there's, like I said, there's that healthy fear. Well, we have that with the Lord, and if we have that, the Bible says... That we have confidence. For the Lord shall be thy confidence. It says in the previous verse, I, I'm sorry, I read the wrong one. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. So first of all, we see that Caleb had character. And his character was displayed despite opposition from within and opposition from without. And it was displayed by being determined. Then we saw that he has confidence he has confidence that the Lord is better than man and princes. He has confidence in the Lord, and he'll keep him from his foot being taken. And he also has the fear of the Lord, which gives him strong confidence. Thirdly, okay, and there's only four, okay, uh, he had courage. Now, I tried to make everything jive, so don't make fun of my alliterated points here, okay? He had courage despite grasshoppers despite giants, and despite gray hairs, okay? So they all, I was trying to get you so you could remember them, okay? So first of all, despite grasshoppers, what do they say? They said, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Isn't that what it says? What are grasshoppers? Tasty. I used to eat them when I was a kid. They're very good. 
The only problem is the legs get caught in your throat when you try to swallow them. So you have to wash them down with a glass of water. But they taste like raw corn on the cob. You would never know you're eating a grasshopper. Okay? Sorry, parents. I didn't mean to get your kids interested in that. But didn't kill me. Right? So despite grasshoppers. what? So just to try to picture, right? And, and as you read the Bible, you should do this. Try to picture things. How tall does someone have to be for you to be the size of a grasshopper on their site? I mean, look, I mean, look at the ground sometime and see those grasshoppers, and you think, boy, what a comparison, right? So, in other words, and, and I have written down next to this to break it down a little bit, grasshoppers. And what are, what are grass? They had the cannot be done complex, right? Pastor gets up and he says, "We're going to try something new." And 50 people say, that can't be done. We've never done that before. We're going to change things? We can't do that. Right? You know what? You can, you, I thought, well, maybe some people thought this. I don't know. Nobody verbalized it. But honestly, you know what's funny? Is you, you, think, you think you know the reaction to, of what somebody's going to say before you ask them. You ever do that? Like, well, if I ask this person, this is what they're going to say. So I, when I asked Pastor, I said, I would like to change how we do junior church. I thought he'd say, I need some time to think about it. Let's wait on this. And when he said, yeah, I think that's a wonderful idea, I about fell over. Because I, I, I thought that would never happen. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh. I didn't know what to say. I was kind of caught by surprise for a minute. But we can be uh, against change, right? Especially as we get older. I'm a routine person. Um, my wife is not, my wife's very organized in routine when it comes to things. But when it comes to meals, I'm a routine person. I'm one of these weird people. I could eat the same meal every day. If it's something I like, I could eat it every day. I don't get sick of it. I like it. I'll continue to eat it every single day. I'm a routine person. She likes to have a different meal every day for two weeks. I'm like, what are you doing? You're, you know, the, the world's not going to turn correctly. And we, you know, we have this menu of we're going to have this on this day and this on this day. And then to make things you know, lively in our home, I'll, I'll be looking forward to macaroni and meatloaf, macaroni and cheese and meatloaf, and I get home and I say, where's the, where's the macaroni and cheese? Oh, I changed the menu. We're having a grilled chicken Caesar salad tonight. And I'm like, Whew. ruined my day. I've been looking forward to meatloaf and macaroni and cheese all the Well, I didn't feel like meatloaf and macaroni and cheese today. But I still love her, okay? Right? Because, like I said, I'm a routine person, okay? I don't know everybody's, my wife's not a routine person when it comes to eating, right? But, you know, we don't, we don't like change. But you know what? He had courage to do what was right. These people, they said, whoa, this cannot be done. We can't do this. And we do that sometimes. God says, I want you to do this. And you say, huh, that can't be done. We may not say it out loud. Or sometimes pastors will say, we're going to try this. That can't be done, right? There's, I, I, I read this um, thing about this uh, guy. It says, there is a story of a 90-year-old who decided to travel around the world. His friend came up to him in distress, saying, you shouldn't try a trip like this. I might not see you again. The 90-year-old replied, you may be dead. Yeah, you're right. You may be dead when I get back. Right? So, you know, he had the can-do attitude, you know? I'm going to jump out of planes, even though I'm 90 years old. Or I don't know. I don't, maybe he wasn't doing that. But I've heard of people that do that. So despite grasshoppers, the cannot-be-done complex. Despite giants, right? Was Caleb afraid of giants? Was Joshua afraid of giants? No. Because they looked at the giants from God's point of view. Just like, you know what? I just read um, uh, David, the David and Goliath story in my de devotions. Story, okay, it actually happened. Sometimes when you say story, it's like, oh, it's just a story in the Bible. No, it actually happened, right? So David and Goliath, 
Saul said, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, you're going to get yourself killed out there. I'm adding to this story, okay? Um, and he said, no. He goes, I go out and I take care of my father's sheep. And he said, with, with the Lord's help, I've grabbed a lion and killed it. I've killed a bear. I've done whatever is necessary to kill anything that was coming against the sheep. And he says, this, this man doesn't scare me. God is bigger than this. That's the attitude that Caleb had. That's the attitude that, that Joshua had, is they had courage in spite of grasshoppers, the right that cannot be done complex, and giants. And despite gray hairs, did God give Caleb, you know, he, this is what God does. He reveals something to you. I heard somebody preach a message one time. And he said, uh, the title of the message was, Traveling Without the Star. And basically the premise was, sometimes God reveals something that he wants you to do, but he's not ready for you to do it yet. He just gave you a little glimmer of it. Remember, remember Joseph? He was, a te- he was a young teenager. And God said, here's what's, here's what's going to, here's the dream. This is what's going to happen. And guess what? It happened. But it didn't happen for another 20 years. Right? God does that to us. He'll say, this, he'll show things to us, and then they'll come to pass later. It says, turn over to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. So he showed him, right? 40 years old. 45 years later, it's coming to pass. And from, where is Numbers? Okay, there, <laughs> sorry. Couldn't find it. I lost it for a second here. But he showed him something, and 45 years later, God, is, God likes to do that. But what, is, what, is he, what was he that entire time? He was faithful, right? He, he stuck with the stuff. He, he did what he was supposed to do. says in verse 32 and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel saying the land through which we have gone to search is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature and there we saw the giants the son of Anak which come of the giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so we were in their sight so this is that 40 years old he saw that right and then We get over to the thing, 45 years later, he's 85, and now he's getting ready to do something. Turn over to Joshua chapter 14. Now he was doing things all along, but he sees sees the victory. Deuteronomy, Joshua, okay. Joshua chapter 14. I looked up some some interesting things. And I have uh, written down here, the time of old age with its infirmities seems to me to be a time of particular blessedness and privilege to the Christian. And that's not just old age. God, When God allows us to go through things, even at a younger age, we look at it like it's, you know, Paul, remember Paul talked... Um, he says, uh, I've got a thorn in the flesh, and he asked for it to be removed. That's our natural reaction. Most people, when something painful happens to them, and they or something painful lingers, they don't say, you know, oh, I want to keep this around forever. Right? Our, I, I think most people's natural reaction is we want to get rid of it. We don't, we don't want to be in pain. Uh, I, I remind, but you know what? God can be strong on your behalf. Um, I, I remind the kids in junior church of this all the time. Pastor, we all know Pastor Gip, or most of us know Pastor Gip. He used to be the pastor of this church, travel, travels as a preacher, preaches all over the country. And I don't think it's changed, but I think he has had a migraine headache for five years, every single day, 24 hours a day. He gets up every day. He reads 30 pages of his Bible. 
He preaches all over the country. He drives a camper from church to church. Your ingrown toenail doesn't feel so bad now, does it? <laughs> right? And there's, there's people even in this church, there's, you know, there's all the, we all, everybody has dealt with different things. I understand that. Do you, don't you think he's ever asked God and said, could you please take these headaches away? I would think, right? I know when I pray for him, I ask for the headaches to be taken away, right? I get a migraine headache and my whole world comes to an end. And maybe that's just revealing me. I mean, I get, I get going to, fortunately mine go away pretty quick, right? Paul says, my grace, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect and weakness. And what happens? You know what? You know what happens if we respond the right way? As we get older and as things happen to us and, and our body isn't the same as it used to be. And, uh, you know, the other day we get these alarms that go off at work. We call them red dots. And when a red dot goes off, you start running. They tell you where it is and you go because something's going on. And then they say, code yellow? Oh, I hate that. Code yellow, that means an officer's in trouble. And the, the other day I was running, and this, is, this may seem, I didn't pray this prayer when I was 20 years old, but I'm running, and I said, Lord, please help me to keep running till I get there. Help me not to trip on a stone. <laughs> I didn't think of those things when I was 20 years old. Help me not to look like an idiot when I am sprawled out on the ground because I trip over the curb, right? Weird things. And then I did pray for protection, but I, I was weirdly more concerned about running the entire time because it was a pretty far distance to go. I'm like, please help me to be able to run the whole time. I don't want to be that guy where they think I just gave up, you know, and let the officer struggle on his own, right? We, we realize that, you know what, but we get more closer to God, though. I, I was just, uh, and Karen and I were talking about this before, I don't usually make public endorsements of things, okay? If you look up on YouTube a message you put in, Kenny Baldwin, are you a real Christian? Look it up and watch that message. You will get such a blessing from it. When I was a, a kid, we went to a youth rally. I'll never forget, we went to a youth rally and he was 17 years old, I think, at the time or something like that, 17 or 18 years old. And he was, a pre he was preaching, and he was a phenomenal preacher then at 17 years old. Has tons of scripture memorized. Matter of fact, in this message, Are You a Real Christian, quotes an entire chapter of Romans without even, you know, not, without even thinking about it. But he was in the hospital and almost died. He's 40... I think he's in his early 40s. And almost died and was weak, still is weak, for the longest time. And he's a much better preacher now than, and he was a great, he was a great preacher at 17. He's an even better preacher now. And he said, in this message, and he said, listen, would I choose this? <laughs> no. But God, I can see God being strong on my behalf. 40 years old, played basketball, full court basketball games, did all that before he got sick. Now has to preach sitting on a stool because he can't stand up and preach. He has to preach sitting down. Well, guess what? My strength is made perfect in weakness. We don't like, okay, I shouldn't say we. I'll just put me there, okay? I'm not going to speak for you because I know me. I don't like being weak. What do, uh, what do teenage boys do? Not all of them, but at some point, most of them, what do they do? When they're especially around girls, they show off. What do they show off? Their strength. Right? They're like, look at me. I said, again, not all, but I'm just saying. You know, walk around, oh, that's heavy, nobody can lift that. I can lift that. Right? That's, that's what they do. I still do that. Okay? To my wife. I, no one else. Okay? You know? 
Nobody can, oh, you can't get that lid off? <laughs> right? Because that's just, right? Because we, we think we're strong, right? But guess what? God has a way of not beating, he, he does it in love. But he makes us weak so that we rely on him for strength. And I mentioned this before. When I had shoulder surgery, it was horrible. My wife would say to me, don't be afraid to ask for help. And I'm like, I, oh, I don't want to ask for help. I don't want to admit that I can't do something. Right? But that's, that's good for us to admit, you know, that we can't pick up 10 pounds. That's, it's, for me, it was very humiliating, okay, <laughs> that I can't shovel my own driveway. I can't, you know, I, I couldn't drive. Actually, that was the worst part for my wife and for me, right? <laughs> but uh, I'm not a good passenger, okay? I'll just be honest. I'm working on it. Um, but hopefully I don't have to work on it again for a long time. But I wrote down some things about, real quickly, I'll go through these. I'm not going to read all of them. But, and, and this is mostly speaking of older age, okay? But the same thing, again, can apply to younger people. Commodore Vanderbilt built most of his railroads when he was well past 70. Tennyson was 83 when he wrote Crossing the Bar. Benjamin Franklin most helped his country after his 60th birthday. Now, this is not an advertisement for don't do anything for God until you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s. That's not what I'm saying, okay? But I'm saying is God, number one, has things for you still to do if you're older, but he also can help, he, does, he helps people. John Glenn, Returned to space at age 75. Uh, Michelangelo was still producing masterpieces at 89 years old. Right? These people were still accomplishing things. Why? Because they, as they got older, right, they, you know what? It's funny. When you're young and you're, you're full of strength, sometimes, at least this is the way I can be still, but, and not so as much, you think you're invincible. And sometimes, as my dad used to tell me, don't be a bull in a china shop. And he'd say, Th think about this. You know, and you're just whipping things and doing whatever and throwing things everywhere. And, you know, he goes, think this through here, right? Well, as you get older, you, there, you know, a uh, guy in work we were talking about, he's the same age as me, which is none of your business. No, 43. Okay, I'll say it. No, 44. Sorry. My wife gave me that look. Okay, it's 44. Um, 44 years old. He's the same, same, age as, same age as me. And he says, you know what's funny? He goes, I used to climb up on roofs and be on, in heights and all kinds of things. And it never even entered. I didn't even think about it. He goes, there's something that kicks in at 40. It's called the self-preservation mode that you're not as risky. I used to jump out of windows. My, close your ears, mom and dad. I used to jump, no, I used to jump out of the second story window in our house, right? I used to do crazy, my brother and I used to ski off the roof. We, we had big snow piles and we would jump clear over the porch. We could really could have hurt ourselves. But, and we'd land in a big snow bank. My kids, close your ears, right? Um, we, you do those things, now, I, if I'm going to go up a flight of stairs, I calculate my path, right? I'm more careful a little bit, right? Because you that kicks in, you get older, you're a little wiser, and you don't want to get hurt, right? So that's what happens. We we get older, we get, but guess what? We get weaker, and if we respond the right way, and we're having our confidence in the right place, God uses that. Last of all, let's look quickly look at Caleb's conquest. So we looked at Caleb's character, Caleb's confidence, right? He mentioned the Lord nine times. Caleb's courage, and now Caleb's conquest. Back to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14, and I may have already told you to turn there. I don't remember. But verse, verse 12 says... Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in the day, in that day, how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. 
And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great among the Anakims. And the land had rest from war. I have written three things down. First of all, he did not forget, in verse 12, he did not forget God's promise. God promised him something when he was 40 years old. 45 years he waited. You know what? As parents, not even as parents, as Christians, God has given us promises. And sometimes, this is what happens to me anyways, sometimes I trust God, but sometimes I remind him of his promises. Now, God does not forget. But if I'm going to be honest, sometimes I feel like he did forget. And I'm wrong. <laughs> but sometimes I say, you know when you said uh, that if I do this with my children, this is what's going to happen? Especially for moms. I'm not going to speak for moms because I'm not a mom. But I know that my wife sometimes gets a little worn out. I tell her, I have, I have the easy job. I go to work for 16 hours. You're at home dealing with four kids for that amount of time. And I mean that when I say that. I have the easy job. <laughs> and I know sometimes as moms, I'm sure there's days when you say, I know I'm supposed to do this, but this is not happening. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but the kids aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Welcome to the lifelong struggle. <laughs> you just have to trust in God that he is going to, yeah, you, <laughs> you're not going to see it until your kids are maybe 20 years old. I know you don't want to hear that right now. <laughs> and then, or, you know what, you know when you see it, this is what I always tell my wife. I go, this is how, I said, I know you have, you're with them all the time. When you're with your children all the time, guess what happens to their mistakes? They get magnified. Because you see them all the time. You see every little thing that they do wrong. Even when they don't think you see them. Just like I told one of my kids yesterday. I said, you know what's amazing? The wisdom that God gives parents that we can figure things out. Because how did you know that that happened? I'm like, I don't know. God told me. He He gives parents wisdom. It's amazing. Here's how, here's a true test, okay? When your kids go over to someone else's house and you get good reports from someone else's house, and sometimes these people will say things to you and you're like, that, that kid? The kid who just terrorized my house for the last 16 hours? He did that at your house? And, and they're doing something good, okay? That's how you know that you trained your children the right way or are training them the right way. Yeah, you're, you're not always going to see the good things. But God gives you little glimpses along the way and he says, all right, keep it up. Keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Right? He encourages us. And we don't forget God's promise. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Sometimes you have to remind yourself of God's promises. Sometimes, this is what I do, and maybe I'm the only one that does this. I don't know. I don't want to speak for other people. Sometimes, I get tempted with something, or I'm having a bad day, or, or you know what? I feel like the devil's saying to me, you're a loser, or, you know what? You deserve to go to hell because the way you're behaving and I, I can say, to, I talk to him sometimes. I don't know, maybe you don't do this. But I talk to him and I say, shut your mouth. I say it out loud. Now, not when I'm around other people, okay? <laughs> I caught a guy at work talking to himself the other day. He, it, was, it was a little weird, okay? Um, but I, I, I'll say that. I'll be riding in the car 
and I'll say, and I'll, I'll think of something that I shouldn't think of or whatever, and I'll say, leave me alone. Right? I do that. I don't know. Maybe you don't do that. That's okay. If you don't, you're not, you're not wrong. Okay? But sometimes, and I have to say, no, you can't touch me. Yeah, you can, you can try to tempt me with things. You can mess with But you know what? I'm saved, and I don't care what you say. I have assurance of that, and you can't mess with that. Remind them of God's promises. That's what God, God's word, that's God's promises come from God's word. What did God use when the devil tempted him? All three times, he went right back. He said, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, right? So don't forget God's promises. He did not fear, verse 13, he did not fear or complain. I have complained at times in my life. I'm not saying I haven't, but I have hate complaining. Why? Because I know it's not going to help at all. It makes me feel worse when I complain. You know, uh, a simple thing, like, for, for instance, we had a really long day at work, and our boss bought supper for the entire jail. I don't know if he bought it or all when he bought it. I don't, I don't really know. But it came from him. Well, he could have done, but he could have gotten some. Some people have uh, issues and they can't have that. Or, you know, he could have gotten this with that. And he ordered from this pizza place. He should have ordered. I go, guys, you know how much pizza that is? There's a hundred and something officers here. And he bought more than enough for all of us. Well, that's a lot of money. Well, he could have done better. See, and there's always... If we're, if we're in our flesh and honest, all of us can be like that. You know, um, I've, I, I just started to read my Bible over again a oh, month and a half ago or whatever. And I'm in the talk, reading the beginning about the children of Israel, you know, and they complained about all the complaining that they did. You know, and just as God's word said, uh, <laughs> you know, it talks about um, Aaron and, and Miriam. You know what? God didn't respond too favorably to their, their complaining about their brother. So just, you know, he did not fear. Caleb did not fear, and he did not complain. And in verse, the last thing is, he, he had a fruitful life. What's it say in verse 14? It says, Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, unto this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Holy followed the Lord God. That, that means that Caleb was faithful. And because of Caleb's faithfulness, God blessed him. Now, he revealed that, just like I said before, he revealed it to him 45 years before that. But Caleb continued to be faithful. So let me ask you this. Do you have character? Do you have confidence in the right things? Do you have confidence in the Lord? It says, he, he says, confidence in the Lord, our confidence because he's better than man, because he's better than princes. Do you have courage? Do you stand up when others are not standing up? Do you stand up when everybody at work says, well, everybody believes this way, don't they? And you have a chance to say something and you don't do it? And... Do you have conquests? Can you look back and say, I prayed about this and God fulfilled this in my life. God made me this promise and I'm seeing him. Maybe he, the promise hasn't been fulfilled yet, but I'm seeing him fulfill this promise. Are we like Caleb and the things that he was made of? He was made of character. He had confidence. He had courage. And he saw victory in his life. What's going on with you? Are you seeing those things in your life? I don't know about you, but I want to see those things in my life. And I've seen them, but I want to see more of them. And that's exactly how it happens. Priorities are in the right place. We're trusting in the Lord. We're putting confidence in the Lord. And we're realizing that nothing good is coming from us. It's coming from the Lord. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll have an invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can uh, come.
come to church. I'm thankful that we um, can meet in freedom, just as like was mentioned this morning. And uh, there's many people uh, all over the world that are in fear, meeting in fear. They're, um, it's illegal to be a Christian in their country. But yet you allow us to continue to come to church and to worship freely and to travel freely in our country. And I'm thankful for that. And I pray that you'd help us in our lives not to get discouraged and when things uh, difficult things come or when when um, things happen in our life but that we would trust in you and that we would see that you are God that fulfills promises and we're thankful for that and I pray that you'd uh, be with us as we go tonight you give us uh, safety and you'd help us uh, throughout the week we pray in Jesus name if you go ahead and stand to your feet uh, heads bowed and eyes closed